Rick Rubenthal, welcome to Unbroken. Yeah, thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. It's great to have you here. So why don't you let us know a little bit about your background and how you got interested in the three principles? Okay, well, um, <laughs> I won't go too far back. Um, but primarily, uh, uh, you know, my focus has been on my paramedic career. So I've just, although I keep saying recently, it's been almost six years now um, uh, that I retired from uh, being a paramedic. And I spent 30 years of it, uh, bits and parts, mostly in the lower mainland, a uh, little bit on Vancouver Island. Um, and eventually I also uh, took on roles of uh, supervisors, uh, supervisional roles, managerial roles, and uh, also as an educator. So I had an, also a, a wonderful opportunity to travel around the province of British Columbia, meeting different uh, all the paramedics and and having an opportunity to not only train and teach them, um, but also I had a team of instructors also that uh, we were part of uh, putting the paramedic program together. Um, the three principles, uh, getting in, uh, involved in it was in a, like with everybody I think that has ever come across the three principles, it's from a from a seeking point of view, like like searching, like something something we feel is kind of missing, and I I got a brief, and I'll I'll just call it a brief understanding, almost forty plus years ago through a workshop that I had taken that was at the time very controversial, very very um, cutting edge kind of a thing, and and what they were doing was they were pointing to this thing thing that we were more of a thought created world, and 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 how our experiences are being generated and things like that and and i really embraced what they were teaching at that point and and started to experience that as a reality for myself and when i got into paramedicine i often reflected on how different everybody's experiences were with the work mm. and it was so fascinating because um uh Part of my education, you know, they pointed to how stressful the work was, how tough the work can be, um, that we were going to witness a lot of different, we, we were going to see people in, in most cases, in their worst time of their life. And, and I didn't have the experience, the reaction, I would say, or the response that I thought I was going to have as I continued on my career. Well, others were having not so good experiences. Like I, I really enjoyed every moment of, of it, the good, the bad. And I wouldn't say, you know, in a kind of a sick way enjoyed, but <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, like hard to explain, but I, I, I took it as a calling because I, when I first, my very first patient I was able to, um, after the training, that it was my patient. Um, I I remember kneeling down, and and reaching over and, and checking the pulse of this elderly lady, and it and it was sort of like a spark. Just something within me said, like, this is what you should be doing. This mm -hmm. is exactly what you should be doing. And so I just got so involved in in it and uh, wanted to continue to have that same feeling so I caught myself a few times chasing the feeling <laughs> forgetting um so but you no know, long story short I I I had noticed I really would have considered myself to have thrived through the experience of being a paramedic as opposed to others that have survived and some that have not survived because um, the suicide rate in the first responder field, and I don't know why, but particularly in the British Columbia area is actually quite high in comparison to other places in the, in the North America. Um, and the unfortunate part is the stats are really um, not well we're not well informed in that. So to look for information to confirm a lot of things, uh, it, it, it's just not there. Mm -hmm. um, 
because a lot of a lot of what we're experiencing when it comes to post-traumatic stress and suicide and things like that you know they're, they're sort of it's it's not attributed to the work itself so it, it wouldn't be a work safe issue now trauma and and ptsd yes it's a work workplace issue but but the the results of are not sort of saying well it's work related now in fire medicine they're they're starting to get a lot of like cancers and things like that being associated with the work and work compensation is looking at it when it comes to mental health and mental illness as it's being labeled um it's just a different ball game mm -hmm. um and that's another rabbit hole but <laughs> <laughs> so uh when i retired i because because the work gave so much to me, like I had so much experience from the work, I felt I wanted to give back. I mean, I'm still in the scheme of things I consider rel relatively young. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and, and I, I, I believe I still have a lot to offer. So I started to uh, put workshops together. I was, uh, because I was in education and I was part of that, I, I had an opportunity of, of training um, hundreds of people in a Jungian based um, workshop on behavioral uh, studies and, and, you know, what makes you an introvert, what makes you an extrovert and what's, you know, things like that. And there was so much value out of that. People were really tuned into it. They hadn't heard a lot of these things before and opened, opened up a lot of um, new thinking for people. And uh, so I thought, you know, I, I think between what I experienced 40 plus years ago in that one workshop and what I was seeing with this behavioral type workshop, like a Myers-Briggs, um, it wasn't Myers-Briggs, but it was like a Myers-Briggs. Um, and what resonating, I thought that that would be something to offer people. So I did a couple of them outside of uh, out of work and th they were OK, but I always felt there was something missing. And I couldn't put my finger on it. So I did a search and like I found so many others have come, came across Michael Neal's work. Mm. I came across a YouTube video. Why are we not awesome? And I thought, what a great question. <laughs> because, you know, given what we have available to us, particularly now with the internet, um, why aren't we doing better? <laughs> you know, We've got these treatment plans. We've got this going for us. We've got libraries full of self-help books. How, how, how is it possible that that we're, we're, according to all the stats that everybody's presenting, we're doing worse than we were before? Mm. Didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So I really, I started to really listen deeply to what he was saying. And I had to look at it a couple of times. Two things caught my attention. The first thing was, it was resonating. The second thing was the slides that he was using was matching up some of my slides that I was putting together already for a workshop because it was about perspective. It was about, you know, how we were creating, you know, things like that. And I thought, well, okay, there's gotta be, there's gotta be more. And then of course he started to say, um, drop hints about certain people. And I had to go and investigate who these people were. And he was, and so I got more into Michael Neal's work and he talked about, the, uh, Pransky's and Bill Patet, uh, and then uh, he mentioned Sydney Banks, and, and it's like, and Sydney Banks lived on Salt Spring, and I lived on Salt Spring in the 1970s for several years, and never knew about this guy. Oh wow! Yeah. <laughs> um, although uh, a bit of an anecdotal story, I. I believe I actually met him on a ferry oh, going funny. back and forth and actually had a conversation with him um, based on what I've been told from some of the elders. It sounds very much like a Sid thing to do. Mm. Um, and he just casually walked up to me. I was, I was in a suit. I was on my way to my new job as a banker. This is back in the seventies. Um, and, uh, and he just started casually talking to me like, because I, I stuck out like a th sore thumb. People on Salt Spring don't wear suits, at least very often. And so what were you up to? And I said, well, I'm going to a new job. And then he says, well, what's what's worrying you the most about this new job? And I said, 
um, well, you know, I'm curious about the people that I'm going to meet. And then he says, well, what kind of people are you hanging around with now? <laughs> you know, and I said, <laughs> wonderful. I says, we're, we, we get along together and yada, yada, yada. And he says, well, I got a, I got a feeling you're going to find the same people on Salt Spring. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I didn't know I was I was part of a Zen story at that that particular moment, but uh, um, it stuck with me because I, I I went back to my wife that evening and I said, I strangest thing ever happened to me out of the blue. This guy comes meet me on the Salt Spring Ferry, and it's a small boat, right? Yeah. And and when it was all over, I turned my back and then I, I I looked back at him again and he was gone. It was almost like he was an apparition, like just dropped in on me. Right. <laughs> and uh, anyways, so I, I started to really get into the missing link and it truly was the missing link. Mm. What I was kind of searching for that was kind of filling the gaps of what these workshops and how I, I um, felt I needed to contribute to not only the first responders, but to, to anybody that was, you know, more than willing to, to listen to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, and I've never really looked back. I've, I've gone, you know, I, I, I'm gone as I keep going deeper. I keep in, involving myself. Um, you know, it's interesting because I, when I, when you're dealing with education, you're looking for techniques. You know, I've got a whole library of techniques, mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, how to do the presentation, how to do this, you know, and agendas. Mm -hmm. And when I started to hang around the coaches and listening to other people in the community, I couldn't hear anything about techniques. I couldn't. I, I heard this thing about intensives, but nobody would ever, I, I couldn't point to what the intensives were. And, you know, so it was, it was really strange to try and, you know, look for something that never really existed, but was hinted to. Um, and, uh, and then later have a, have a sort of an enlightening dis discovery about them and, and, what we're pointing to when it comes to the three principles um yeah no it it was it was really changing and and at that point i i saw a real big shift in in everything that i was doing in how i was how i was approaching the subject how i was engaging others in a conversation like everything shifted everything mm -hmm. shifted yeah mm -hmm. it, was, it was quite remarkable and so up until that point, I imagine you had been training other paramedics with a lot of techniques to, um, among other things, I suppose, to deal with trauma and PTSD. Is that true? Yeah. Well, yeah, um, we, we actually were starting. So when I first got into uh, as a paramedic, we did we had thing we had labeled it more like burnout. Mm hmm. Okay. Um, you know, and those were terms that were picked up uh, from previous wars. Like par paramedicine is actually uh, was first started in the Vietnam War, mm. um, where they had medics in the field that would go and treat people. Before it used to be, it was a scoop and run kind of a thing, and then they discovered that people actually had a more of a survival rate if if somebody could do something immediately, and then take them to the hospital. Mm the concept of of uh what we term as a stay and play scenario yeah is that actually relatively new like you know 60s so it's um so um uh, yeah so a lot of things are done through protocol mm -hmm. so when you see something this is what you do you know kind of a thing so you run a you run a script um, because at that point, that's the best knowledge that you have of what works. And if you look at, um, if anybody's ever taken CPR or the, you know, those kind of, or Heimlich maneuvers and things like that, those are all relatively new concepts and they were developed through, you know, theories and, and ideas that people had because other things weren't working. Now, 
the way we did CPR 30 years ago is not is not the same way. Again, new information has always mm -hmm. evolved, right? But it's still kind of protocol driven. But there's a lot of there's a lot what I point back to people in in um in what they're experiencing right now is is that the shift happens when new information comes in. Right. So it's like, yes, at our level of understanding, that's the best we did. Well, we we probably harmed a lot of people then. Well, maybe we did. But at that moment, that was the best we knew what to do. And we just did it. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, today we can look back at it and say we might have we might have done a little bit more harm than than um, than good. But again, that's in the past. We have new information. I think our responsibility is, is is to when we have new information is to look at that information from an objective point of view, and say, oh, okay, what if, and let's explore. Mm -hmm. And um, and medicine is an interesting field, especially when you're trying to bring in actually an old paradigm because the original paradigms before psychology took over was very much thought-based. Like it was mm. like looking towards like, why are we thinking, <laughs> you know? Um, and now it's become more behavioral based. So we're, we're systematically treating as opposed to getting up to the source. Um, and in medicine, they're, it, they're very stubborn for a really kind of a good reasonable um reason i would say because the hippocratic oath says first do no harm mm -hmm. and the fear of doing harm i think weighs in when it comes into introducing new mo modalities um new procedures and that's why they research everything so well they want to make sure that we've got it right even though their forefathers didn't worry about that too much <laughs> You know, mm -hmm. kind of a thing. It was sort of like, well, I guess that didn't work. <laughs> Next time we'll keep the leg on and, and see what happens. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, no, it's fun. And so given that, given the way that medicine is slow to adapt things, what has been the response to your bringing this this new slash old uh, paradigm to to paramedics? It's it's mixed. Mm. Um, it's mixed because it's interesting. Uh, you know, the work of Roger Mills. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. A little bit. Yeah. And he was one of the original pioneers with taught with, or was taught through Sid Banks and things like that. And, and in, um, in one of his books I was reading, he was, he was talking about, you know, um, when, when a schizophrenic is having an event and they're wrapped up in in their reality of their thinking doesn't matter what you say doesn't matter what you say mm -hmm. and and i find that very similar right not that they're all everybody's schizophrenic although sid sort of said we are all caught in our own schizophrenia um but we do get caught in our reality and and we believe it's true and we'll respond according to that truth. So it's it's really, it, and when you're wrapped in it, particularly with medicine, thinking that everything I'm doing, I'm, I'm, I believe I'm doing it for all the right reasons. And you absolutely are doing it for all the right reasons. Um, to have something so simple being presented to you, which points you in a 180 degree di uh, direction, um is sometimes very very hard to to accept mm -hmm. um, and i could understand how you know sid you know felt when he was presenting to psychologists and people like that particularly a person that wasn't in the field mm. you know it's one thing for somebody to be in the field and come up with an eureka discovery saying well and that's how freud right freud came up with i have a i have a new discovery i've got this new theory it's called the three egos you know <laughs> not the three amigos the three egos and <laughs> and you know and and everybody kind of bought into it so when you know what's interesting though is that 
if you were to objectively look at what's going on right now, you'd notice that like there's 150 ways of treating depression. There's there's all these modalities. The DCM manual keeps growing as we start to fragment. You know, at one time there was trauma, then there was post-traumatic stress, um, and then there be, was post-traumatic stress disorder. And now, now there's a complex post-traumatic, you know, so like we're, we're fragmenting. And that was the one thing that Dr. Mills was really worried about was that we would continue to, because we weren't getting definitive treatments or people getting well soon enough, that we would specialize things more and more and more, thinking that if we were to dissect it more, we would get better answers. We'd find it. And yet we keep moving ourselves more away from the source than we are going towards the source. Sort of going downstream instead of going up. Upstream and trying to figure out why people are jumping off the bridge in the first place. Right? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you can only, I mean, you see that in our drug addictions and what's happening on the East side, you know, you can, you can bring people out of the water and save them from drowning for just for so long before you just get exhausted. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh, now, from a from a personal point, like getting to an individual, I'm finding that you know anybody that any paramedic that has been willing to sit and and just sort of hear, not to and to remove the judgment, you know, look at it from an objective point of view. I've noticed this remarkable shifts. Mm biggest the biggest one and it's so apropos that that your podcast is called unbroken and i came up a couple of years ago with this idea of the unbroken hero because that's been the biggest significant impact on any first responder who has heard it is they're not broken mm. and i've had paramedics come to me because and and say nobody has ever told me that mm. nobody has ever said i'm broken as a matter of fact i am broken and i'll never get fixed mm. and like things like that and it's like oh my god mm -hmm. like and it breaks my heart because you know that's not true but when you're wrapped up in that reality you you can't see it mm -hmm. and it, when you're really living that reality and, and when i say wrapped up in that reality you are always acting at the level of your belief so if that's what you believe to be true you, you're naturally going to act that way you're going to naturally act unbroken you're going to or broken um that that you'll do things under the guise of well i'm I, I'm going to have to somehow manage with my pain or manage with my illness um, and learn to learn about the struggles and do, you know, like all the different things that they have to do. And it's it, it, as sad as it is. It turns out that suicide is the only option, mm -hmm. you know, based on that level of understanding if I am so broken and I have to learn to live with it, whatever mm -hmm. it is, I, I didn't, I didn't ask for that. I didn't, I didn't get in on this earth to have that. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah. And, and as, as we know, as you limit, limit that, it becomes truer and truer that that's, that's your whole world. Yeah. I mean, what else would you do? I mean, any, yeah. it sounds unreasonable, but in some ways it's a reasonable thing to do. And it, and it, and it's interesting that the, in, um, in Canada, we have the maid, I call it the maid service, but it's not maid service. It's, it's, uh, you know, the MAID, the medical assisted induced death. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and people who are in good frames of mind who happen to have a disability in the sense of, you know, a terminal cancer um, and from all indications, 
you know, they're, they're probably going to have a worse sort of un, very uncomfortable ending that while they have some kind of sanity for lack of better descriptions and words that they choose to have a more meaningful death mm -hmm. where they can celebrate it with friends and family and things like that. And I really get that. I really get that part. Um, and then it it sort of expanded its criteria to to look at disabilities like physical disabilities and this is just some something recent that i discovered that i think it was over the last year or two years they've included you know so if you've got something that has diminished your quality of of life from a physical disability side and again you're you're deemed sort of rational that you could ask request for a medical assisted death um and i and i and as i was reaching researching some of this because what had ended up happening it was just recently and now they've stopped for more research they wanted to include mental illness as part of the criteria mm. and from everything that i've been able to get my hands on and research both from the principal side of equation and 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 others is that the community is split there's nothing definitive when it comes to like we can't even agree on which what is the correct treatment for right i mean yeah we have we have uh treatment guidelines when it comes to producing drugs and giving people things like that but when you look at all the different modalities that are out there um you know, and everybody's saying that they have the answer. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but nobody's has the answer in the sense of a consistent um, result, right? It's not like, you know, two plus two equals four in the psychology world. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and and we they would love it. We would all love that, right? So uh, and I've been writing a lot of letters to my member of parliament and both both the opposition and and, the, and who's in power now, you know, explaining to like we this is too much of a slippery slope. First of all, if we agree to include it in this type of uh, service, what are we saying about the psychology field? Mm -hmm. What are we saying about mental illness? Are we saying that mental illness can't be cured? Um, like I, those are, those are curious questions I'm asking, right? Um, but on my experience, we're not broken. Mm -hmm. Our, our thinking system works quite well. As a matter of fact, maybe too well, in the sense of, you know, um, and when you see it for what it is, when you see it and, um, and 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 I just use my life as an example because how can I go through something that everybody else can't seem to go through? Like I, my partner will have a different experience to me. Mm -hmm. um, I I know you live out in the Tofino area, and um, I don't know if you remember several years back there was a, a tragic ambulance accident at Kennedy Lake. Mm -hmm. Those were two of my crew members. Oh no! And, yeah. Um, and it was probably the most intensive three weeks that I've ever spent. And I spent three weeks in Tofino. I, you know, um, not only through the recovery, through the investigation, through putting the ceremony together, um, and laying them to rest, you know, was on my shoulders. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, and even though I had not had sort of the a formal three principles understanding at that point i knew enough of when i was getting stressful and i knew enough to understand my feelings and how they were creating a situation that if i kept holding on to that paintbrush that's how things were going to get painted and this mm -hmm. it says you know like you know our thoughts are the paintbrush and that's why I was so missing link because every time everything I heard, I go, yes, I've experienced. I yes, I know that. I see that. Um, and my team, 
all said at the end like it was a they said because i was calm that it, you know that calming force but just having that context of knowing that if we can keep it at this level we could do a whole lot better and there were so many tough decisions to make that if i had gotten into my head there's and struggle there would have been a lot more struggle involved in it mm -hmm. and there's so much wisdom and guidance in in and we talk about that in the impairment and that in um ambulance calls like we talk about being in the flow of a call we talk mm -hmm. about you know like we teach people not to rush into scenes like not to get involved in the anxiety of the scenes like so intuitively we've been teaching this for a long time we just didn't do the connection between the post-traumatic stress and the mental illness and the, and the unrest that was happening afterwards as being part of the same equation. We just kept pointing towards the, you know, when you're in a flow state, you're in a perfect balance between what you know what to do and the right timing and things like that, right? And it's like, well, that's on offer every time, mm -hmm. right? Not just on ambulance calls. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. You you touched on there the Unbroken Hero Project. So can you tell us a bit more about what that and what it entails? So yeah, um, I was in a workshop, um, a Three Principles workshop that was being conducted um, in London uh, live on on stream, um, and um, I started to listen to the testimonials of people that were taking the 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 principles the understanding into prisons and youth uh organizations and things like that and something struck me and came up with this unbroken hero you know it's just sort of like it just it just made sense you know because i know there's a lot of connotations around being a hero especially in the first responder field mm. um there's very a lot of culture you know uh we're still living the the macho man type of reality although mm -hmm. there's a lot of females in the in the field um and be, and they've they're not bought in they're uh, i did a um podcast on this one time around uh like the females coming in are taking on that same mindset that they have to be mentally, they have to be the tough ones now and forget about their feminine side kind of a thing. And the guys are going, well, I don't want anything to do with my feminine side, you know, kind of a thing, right? And forgetting that we're all just this, we're one bundle of energy and experiences. But uh, so they're they're trapped in, in the macho game. Mm. They have to prove themselves which is even more extra thinking and more extra thought added onto the whole layer of things, right? Mm -hmm. So not only, you know, are they being judged constantly on every call and everything that they do, and they know that, right? So, I, you know, I hats off to any female that wants to get into the service because, yeah, unfortunately, it's getting better, you know, as as but it's there's still a long ways to go. Mm -hmm. Um. But it's all layers of thinking. It's all layers of thought. And that's what's getting in the way of doing good calls. And we we often know that. Like you, we often say things like, you can't take the last call you did into the next call. Mm. We never told them why. <laughs> Other than intuitively, you know, but but it just goes to, you know, like like you know, like you won't perform better. Like you will have, right? So you have to treat every call fresh and new, regardless if 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 this is the tenth tenth um, um, chest pain call you've done today, mm. <laughs> right? And so it's interesting. There is so much of the, and I'll just label it as principles, but because the principle is is universal, but when you un you have that understanding and you have that bit of a lens you start to see the evidence of how the principles work everywhere. We're just not calling it that. We're just not pointing people to that. And yet, the more we point people to 
those things, particularly the responders, like you you already understand what flow means. You already understand not taking past thinking. We don't call it, we say your past call into a next call. You, We've got all that in place. We just haven't bundled it properly. So that's mm-hmm. kind of what I've been doing is kind of bundling the experiences of being a first responder. And I've I've also got uh, firefighting experience. I have spent 11 years. It's a volunteer service, but I, it, I, I fought fires. Fire, a fire is a fire. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, a rescue is a rescue. And whether I was a full-timer or a part-timer, that's, uh, you know, that's up to, you know, people do whatever they do with those labels. But, um, and a call is a call, you know. So I spent a lot of years in the streets, a lot of it downtown Vancouver, very busy call volume. Um, did I have tough days? I had tough days, you know, did, were there days where, where I was totally exhausted at the end? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Um, but here I am today and there's a reason for that. Um, not because I'm special. Um, it's just that I have a little bit of information, a little bit of an understanding or a level of, um, consciousness uh, you know to to what's going on and that's all it takes you know it just takes it doesn't take a big leap right it's just it's it really is dropping and getting curious Mm -hmm. letting go of what you think to be true and just be curious about well maybe maybe there is something different and how do you bring this to paramedics and other organizations? Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, right now, um, I at first I was, my strategy has changed. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, uh, I, I, I have less of a strategy than I had in the beginning because at first I thought, okay, I've got to get into the academy. I have to, you know, get into right? Because I see the benefits of it. And I still do. I absolutely still do. There's no doubt about it. Um, Because what we're teaching people nowadays, and uh, from what I'm hearing is, it's not when you're going to have post-traumatic stress, like, or it's not if, it's when, Mm. you know, and if we're starting to teach people to be in that mindset, we're going to be you're going to be the creator of your future. And that if that's kind of what you're being taught, then yeah, it's, it's no question that you're, we're seeing a rise of it. Um, And to get that understanding that it's not the work that's causing your, your stress, right? It's the thinking about the work that's causing your stress. And, and I had this, great little metaphor i was i was sharing with a with a client a couple of days ago and um Mm -hmm. i just happened to be looking at a at a napkin holder and the napkin holder was the kind that had a bit of a weight on the on the top so there was like a um a little roller on top and and a, a, a bunch of napkins uh were holding the roller up right and I said, um, I said, it's it's like this napkin holder. <laughs> and yeah, I said, you know, the, the napkin is the layer of thinking that you have about the situation. And I said, what happens when you take that thinking away? And I and I physically took it away and and the roller dropped to the bottom. And I said, what do you think happens with that? And he says, Well, the problem kind of goes away. <laughs> And I said, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Because the only thing that's holding that problem in place is the layer of thinking, the layer of thought that's there. And when we identify ourselves with that layer of napkins as being our reality, we forget the fact that we are the napkin holder. (laughs) We're the ones that are holding the napkin in place. So um, yeah. it was so funny a light just went right on just like Mm -hmm. that and that's how simple it is like you know like like it is a simple concept but we've got so much of these complexities and and paradigms that say 
treatment has to be complicated or it doesn't mean anything. Um, things like, you know, I was talking today, you know, like we have to have the struggle before we can have the happiness. Like who bought into that? <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, you know, but innocently, somebody, that's how life looks like. And then we sort of say, you know what? I have struggle. I can see that. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. So um, I've, um, I still continue to attract and, and uh, take every opportunity I can to speak to groups and organizations, to speak to um, individuals that reach out to me. Um, and, uh, and if anybody comes across on my radar, I, I just automatically reach out. Um, so I've been doing it more from an organic type of um, seeing what comes and then responding accordingly um with not a lot of sort of well i must have must do kind of a thing mm -hmm. and um you know my intention is to continue to do it that way and and as people start to have their turnaround they're telling other people and and um you know part of me goes it's not fast enough um but it is what it is <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So you work with first responders then individually. Is that true? Like coaching them? That, that is true. Yeah. Uh, pr primarily the bulk of my work is, is one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. um, I do um, have been putting on uh, various uh, workshops, uh, usually at the beginning of the year. Um, and, uh, and there's a few things I've got on uh, like just, some thoughts that I've put down just as place card holders, you know, kind of the, that I feel in the moment. Um, uh, you know, I'm kind of looking for some more nudges and direction on that. Um, I believe um, um, I started a men's group that was worked out pretty good for a while. And then it kind of, you know, went away. Mm -hmm. um, and and that was an interesting experience too. Um, again, uh, not having any agendas other than just to bring people together to talk about their shared experiences, mm -hmm. and um, uh, and I find that mo most helpful because I think what's lacking is is their voice, like for them to be heard more of mm. the silence has to be broken there has to be avenues for them you know um to speak to speak more and we're also discovering within the organization that uh maybe the debriefings are actually not doing as as are not being as helpful as as we thought we were there were in the first place because there was this paradigm was you know, if we relive the ex experience, went oh, over it. Yeah. You know, get get it out, mm -hmm. get it out. <laughs> it would be helpful. And I've had paramedics come to me going, I can't, I, I don't like this treatment plan I'm going through. Uh, they're asking me to relive everything over again, over again, and over again until until I become numb to it. Right. And it's like, and I'm and I'm not. I'm not having a good enough experience. And I said, well, you do have every right to, to pick something else. There's enough of them out there. Mm -hmm. And that's the other thing, you know, being a, uh, an agency um, that's funded by the taxpayers here in the province is that everything has to be bidded out. So if you're, if they're looking for a type of program, then it, it has to come from the, the bidder. Right. So, People present, this is what I have to offer. This is the kind of things I do. So, so I mean, one size does not fit all. They've, we know that. They, they know that. Um, but paramedics and other first responders are kind of stuck with what the agency has bought. Mm. And it's through their medical doctor that sometimes they can get other treatment plans and, you know, get that changed and, Workman's compensation seems to be more lenient about, you know, well, you know, you have to at least try this, right? And then you get 10 visits after 10 visits. If nothing works, we'll revisit it again, you know, kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, 
and there's so many limitations on on the on it like things like yeah you only get 10 visits if you're not cured in 10 then what are we going to do you know kind mm -hmm. of a thing mm -hmm. um one year to be on this program and after the year you're on your own you know all those different things like and then and then we have to throw in this mix well if you're not going to get well anyways here's another option you can ask for a medically induced death mm. and i go oh man that's so sad i mean that's we we can do better we can do better mm -hmm. right yes. do i have all the answers i'm not going to pretend i know the answers i'm not going to pretend um but i certainly can point people to an area where their common sense kicks in mm -hmm. and you can see it for yourself yeah and that's where i am right now so in the beginning it was more more like a teaching and educating because I, that's my path that was my normal path now it's more just pointing and supporting mm -hmm. oh lovely well, we're co almost coming to the end of our time together. Rick, is there anything we haven't touched on that you'd like to share today? <laughs> uh, we've, we've covered, we've covered the, the good basics, you know, the, the, if that's the one message to really understand and explore the, the idea, let's just explore the idea that you're not broken mm -hmm. and start from there. Nice. Lovely. Where can we find out more about you and your work? Google me. I'm everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> You'll find all sorts of great things and and maybe not so great things. Um, I, yeah, I'm. I have the Unbroken Hero Project um, website. I'm on Instagram, Rick Rupenthal. Um, I've decided to sort of rebrand myself just as Rick Rupenthal. It's much easier that way. Um, yes, I work with first responders, but I also work with with all sorts of different people from all different box you know um i uh recently had some great conversations with some teenagers and um i just love being in this conversation not from a correcting or a healing point of view i just love having in this being in the conversation and then you hear what you want to hear and we'll go from there yes Oh, nice. Well, thank you so much for being with me here today and talking about your work. I really appreciate it. Thank you for offering. Take care, Rick. Bye-bye.